billion dollars worth of budget savings. To discuss all that and more, I'm joined by Ben Oquist from the Australia Institute in Canberra uh, and in Melbourne, uh, Daniel Wilde from the Institute of Public Affairs. Gentlemen, thanks very much for being there to both of you. Ben, I might go to you first of all because you'll remember when Pauline Hanson entered the parliament way back in 1996. Then she was one member and regarded pretty much by all sides as a pariah. Now she's in the Senate and not only that, we have a situation where the primary vote for the major parties has been eroded significantly, but she's got three other colleagues as well in a crossbench of some 20. It's a very different proposition, isn't it, for both major parties, but particularly for the Coalition and Malcolm Turnbull, because there will come times over the next three years where he does need her vote. Just how does he handle her without uh, the Coalition uh, suffering as a consequence and without uh, enhancing uh, her authority as well, with important elections, I might say, coming up in WA, uh, sorry, in WA, but also in Queensland too, where she may make further inroads as well? Well, she is a big new force. You're right, Jim. It's different to 1996. I do remember in 1996, my former Bob, boss, Bob Brown, was giving his first speech at the exact same time as she was giving her first speech in the House. She's now in the Senate, as you say, with three colleagues. And she's a survivor. And she's a clever politician. And she's improved her game over that time. She's calculating. She's cunning. She knows what she's doing. Um, first of all, I think, the, of course, the government's going to have to deal with it. She's got balance of power in the Senate. That's very different to last time. Uh, first of all, I think the government's got to start by not adopting her policies. And uh, we've seen George Christensen railing, sounding a little bit like a, a, um, a mini Pauline Hanson um, in uh, the other chamber. And I think they'll do well to... And Turnbull's made some statements this week, distancing himself from some of those statements from Christensen. But she's going to have to be taken on and taken on in a sophisticated way. I mentioned previously uh, our polling has her on 10% in the Senate nationwide now and some 16% in Queensland. I think that's a big looming issue about how both major parties are going to handle her in Queensland. She's a big new force, um, but she needs to be taken on systematically. And we need to protest against her, uh, but we also need to dissect her arguments. And I think it's worth going through that maiden speech, that first speech, and having a close look at it. She has some very strange ideas in it, and a lot of those ideas are actually imported directly from the United States, um, from some strange places in the United States. It's not... Some of her ideology, ideology is not homegrown Australian stuff. It's imported from the United States, and I think it's important that's exposed. Her crazy ideas about Islam not being a religion uh, come directly from some weird places in the United States. And I point to that example, and there'll be others, where she needs to be taken on properly and looked at exactly what she said and some of it exposed. And I think that, in the end, is the only way to defeat uh, Pauline Hanson and what she stands for for the major parties. But it is a big test, I think, in particular in Queensland. Might get to George Christensen in a moment, but uh, Daniel, if I could go to you, is it wise, uh, do you think, uh, in uh, Pauline Hanson's current circumstances with three uh, senators, or three more senators as well, her four in total, uh, for the Greens, for example, to walk out during her first speech, which hardly suggests uh, a, uh, an adherence to uh, the, pro uh, the, uh, the principles of democracy, let alone free speech. Mm. But secondly, on the other hand, is it wise for members of the government and one minister at least, uh, Michaelia Cash, embracing her after she gives a first speech uh, full of the kind of language and ideas that uh, Ben was uh, 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 reporting there? I don't think Michaelia Cash was embracing Pauline Hanson in that instance, and then that's been a bit overhyped. But I do think that the government should be making sure that they don't uh, follow some of the policy prescriptions that were put forward by Senator Hanson in her maiden speech, particularly her railing against uh, globalisation and free trade. Both globalisation and free trade have unambiguously been good for humanity, and when we couple that uh, with the importance of free enterprise and the importance of rule of law, uh, these things have brought uh, hundreds of millions of people uh, out of poverty and there is, uh, I think, a global uh, direction uh, we've seen certainly in the US election with Bernie Sanders having a lot of popularity and also, of course, Donald Trump who have gone 
for nationalist uh, populist policies. Uh, they've sought to turn away uh, from globalisation and they've questioned the value of free trade. It's important uh, that Turnbull and the Turnbull government double down in uh, making clear to the public what the benefits are of free trade and globalisation. We need more of it, not less. Ben, you were talking earlier about uh, George Christensen. Now, it's uh, quite clear that in his seat of Dawson in the lead-up to the election, he was very worried about uh, what One Nation might or might not do to his majority there, pleading with Pauline Hanson not to run a candidate. There are elections not too far away at the state level in Queensland. I've seen suggestions that in that election... Uh, uh, that One Nation could pick up as many as six seats. This is a real force, certainly north of the Tweed, is it not? Yes, and that's right. And the, the combination of the new Senate voting system and the double dissolution election has meant that Pauline Hanson come, has come in not just by herself, but another colleague in Queensland, two more across the country, has made her a big national force. And that's going to give her extra profile, extra opportunities in that Queensland election. It's important, as I said, to look at um, the details of what she's prescribing um, and tackle it where necessary. But it's also important to look at the underlying causes of some of her support. And for many people, it's that the economic growth that we've had has left them behind. That structural adjustments in their town or their region has meant that they're not seeing the benefits of growth. And if you like, it's in part inequality that's driving support for parties like Pauline Hanson. And unless we come to terms with that as a society, it's only going to be, it's only going to lead to increased support uh, for, party, for some parties and some prescriptions being put forward by parties like One Nation. So I think we've got a, ch a challenge to address that inequality and address some of those underlying causes while at the same time taking on what is uh, essentially a racist agenda for Pauline Hanson. But it's a big challenge, I, th I actually think, for both sides of politics coming up in that Queensland election, both the Labor government there and the opposition. We've got a new voting system, got compulsory preferential uh, that could advantage One Nation in certain circumstances, but the challenge will be on the coalition in those instances to rule out preferencing One Nation. I think we're likely to have that big debate again about putting One Nation last. So expect, uh, expect to hear a lot more about that from the Labor Party in the lead-up to the Queensland election. Daniel, uh, uh, Ben there suggesting inequality, alienation uh, being uh, among the reasons that there is this enhanced attraction to One Nation. Do you agree? And secondly, if so, what does the coalition government do about it? I don't agree on the basis that it's been clear by the people who have voted for One Nation and Pauline Hanson that that's not the main issue for them. The main issue uh, for them that have gone to uh, One Nation and Pauline Hanson is a concern, right or wrongly, about uh, immigration, a concern about Muslim immigration. Uh, so to suggest that uh, inequality is driving this trend, uh, I think is impo imposing uh, a preconceived and preferred narrative onto reality. Uh, and insofar as inequality is a problem more broadly, uh, not just in the context of Paul enhancement, more broadly in society, we need to really look at the regulations in the red tape that are preventing people from getting job opportunities, that are preventing investment and that are preventing the expansion of free enterprise that of course provide opportunities for those on the lowest rungs uh, to move up in society. Let's turn to uh, Stephen Conroy, uh, Ben, if, uh, if I could. Resignation after 11 weeks or 11 weeks after the uh, July 2nd election, saying he wants to spend more time with his family. He does have a young child and uh, it was a very difficult uh, uh, pregnancy and uh, surrogacy arrangements that surrounded that. But do you take him at face value when he says that he simply does want to spend more time with his uh, young child, Bella, or do you see more behind it than that? And does it say something about Bill Shorten's leadership? I don't think it says something about Bill Shorten's uh, leadership. We're not really seeing any evidence of that. And that's not to say that uh, Stephen Conroy hasn't been important to Shorten and his leadership and his performance. He's been a big ally, and I'm sure Shorten will miss, miss him. I don't know what was going on on Friday. We had uh, Conroy leaving, uh, we had the Senate clerk leaving, uh, we had the head of finance department, Jane Holton, leaving. It was moving day in Canberra. 
but Conroy is a very important figure for the Labor Party and he's been a very important figure in the Senate. Now, I don't think that's been discussed too much over the last 24 hours. He's really a lion of the Senate. And those big Senate figures who know how to work the Senate, know how to use it best, um, are, are missed. And he'll be missed in that sense. Uh, the parties need those type of people who can play Senate politics well, and Conroy is one of them. Uh, he, he's, had a, he's had a brilliant career, really, for the Labor Party uh, as a communications minister. And, of course, the NBN. Um, while it's been a controversial project, I think time will um, be on his side and history will be on his side in that. It's, after all, the country's biggest infrastructure project and I think in the end it's going to go down well. Um, the departure was somewhat unusual and I saw Tanya Plibersek cleaning up the mess in that regard and no doubt Conroy wants to go on and do other things. Uh, but he's going to be missed uh, for his Senate prowess and he's going to be missed by Bill Shorten. Indeed, uh, and Daniel, he will be missed by Bill Shorten. The challenge for the Labor Party, of course, will be his replacement uh, in Victoria. Already the Victorian left in the person of Kim Carr is challenging the right, uh, the faction from which uh, Stephen Conroy comes, uh, to make sure it's a woman and a woman of significance. And this is important for the Senate as a whole because uh, talent... It's pretty scarce once you get before, uh, below the, uh, the top two or three on either side in the Senate. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I think one thing that will be uh, quite important from a public policy perspective is how this plays out with regard to the uh, proposed media uh, regulation changes that have been put forward by the Turnbull government with respect to uh, relaxing uh, the media ownership laws. Uh, Senator Conroy was staunchly opposed to relaxing uh, the ownership laws throughout the bulk of his time uh, in the Senate. And I think this is an opportunity for the Turnbull government maybe to make some ground on that area. It is a good reform. Uh, and uh, hopefully the next uh, Senate candidate, uh, however that emerges uh, from their process, uh, will have a more updated view uh, about the appropriateness of the current uh, tighter uh, regulation of media ownership, given uh, the substantial change uh, to the media landscape that has taken place uh, over the last 20 years from when uh, Senator Conroy first entered Parliament. Yes, Senator I, Stephen I Conroy, certainly no, no friend of uh, News Corporation. Very briefly, Ben. Uh, yes, I, I mean, uh, as Wayne Swan said this morning, um, Stephen Conroy is a man of strong views and you were in no doubt where he stood on them and he fought them hard and media ownership and regulation and control are things that were very passionate to him and he made the communications minister role his own. Uh, but I don't think Michelle Rowland, the, uh, the opposition spokesperson on communications, is any shrinking violet when it comes to media reform either. And they are big, important reforms and they need to be scrutinised very closely before allowing further concentration of media ownership. Conroy's played a big role in that portfolio over a number of years and his legacy, I think, is likely to be carried on within, within Labor uh, in its thinking towards those issues. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, ben Oakwes from the Australia Institute and uh, also Daniel, uh, <laughs> Daniel Walsh from the uh, uh, Institute for Public Affairs. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much to both of you.